This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 261, recorded on March 10th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. My pleasure. Thanks. And from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Good weather there, Michael? No, we have rain and winter's coming back. We oh. we had a bout of really pleasant, no humidity, 70 degrees and sunny weather. And now it's back to, you know, the nasty March weather where it's cold and blustery and raining. And returning to us because he loves it here and we, we love having him. From the University of Puget Sound, Mark Martin, welcome back. It is a microbial pleasure to be here. <laughs> Does that mean it's only a small pleasure? Yeah, that's right. Not on today's topic, Michael. Yeah. That's right. Oh, he's teasing yeah. himself. You, yes. you fed him. You gave him a line, Michael. Yes. That's very good. You guys could be a duo, a comedy duo. Oh. All right. When, um, when Mark is back, that means uh, – we have special things, but we're going to have to wait because first we have a snippet from Michael. Well, this is a really interesting paper, and candidly, I picked it because of Mark. It's entitled Soil Microbiota as Game Changers in the Restoration of Degraded Lands. And this paper was in the March 4th issue of Science, and it's by Koban, Dadeen, Vanderplog, and they are from the Department of Environmental Sciences at Wageningen uh, University and Research of, in the Wageningen, Netherlands. And I'm probably butchering <laughs> Wageningen. Mark is having a heart attack. <laughs> oh, I can never pronounce that. I'm so terrified of mispronouncing things. So. Yes. So I, I know what you're all saying. He fell for another cool title. Well, this paper has much for us to think about. The editors of science and the authors offer us a structured abstract to start a one-page, three-column offering so that you can get into the review. Unfortunately, the review is behind the science paywall, but the structured abstract is not. And that should really give you an overview of what's going on. Now, the opening line is what really hooked me. It gave me chills. So here it is. Soil, the living skin of Earth, provides ecosystem services critical for life. Well, many of us were already aware that soil acts as a filter, stores water, serves as a growth medium that supplies plants and heterotrophs with water and nutrients. Remember, we're one of those heterotrophs, and it offers us a large diversity of organisms and is the source of most of our antibiotics, though the folks down in San Diego are trying to change that by getting us to mine seawater for antibiotics. But that's a twim of a different story. So all of this is true, and it's not really news, as Ilya would say, but I was inspired to select this paper as our guest host today has sent his students off on a scavenger hunt, so to speak. You see, Doc Martin has required his students to collect soil samples, and he's been posting some of the most remarkable images on his Facebook account and on his web pages as they are now presently characterizing the microbes resonant in those soil samples, learning to ask who's there and what might they be doing. I'll offer an interesting story. When I was an associate instructor at IU in the last century, I was teaching a class similar to the one that Dr. Martin is presently offering his students. And I distinctly remember asking my co-instructor, Dr. Shira Blake, where do you get the soil? I'll never forget the look on her face. She looked at me as if I had two heads. 
She offered that she knew I grew up in Chicago, but she thought I had more sense to at least know where one gets dirt. I corrected her. I said it was soil. And for the last 40 years, each time we have gotten together, we had have had great fun remembering the story and more importantly, what our students discovered. You see, she never let me forget that a city boy didn't know where to get dirt, but I'm here to defend myself. Not only did I know, already know the wonder of the soil and the microbiome, I knew that different soils would yield different results, similar to what Doc Martin's students have been uncovering from his soil dilution experiments. However, we still have a good laugh over this all these years later. And when I sent the students out, I told them to go home to their farms in Indiana and bring back some of that great Indiana topsoil. I told them to go outside their dorms. And then IU had this great greenhouse that had a variety of climates and soil types that they were growing a wide variety of plants. So I sent them down to the greenhouse and they brought us some of the most remarkable plates you have ever seen. And that and, and I was teaching M465, which is a companion laboratory course, to a course at IU that was named M460, the biology of the prokaryotes, that was pioneered at the time by Roger Stanier before he left Indiana to move on to UC Berkeley. And so it, it was a course that uh, Stanier started at IU many years before I revived arrive. So the intent of this review, or as its subheading from science actually buttonholes it into, is really restoration ecology, or if you're really out there, terraforming. For you see, all microbiologists, and, and where's the terra grade, Mark? You got to put that back on your shoulder if we're talking about terraforming. Wait, you mean a tardigrade? You mean this? A tardigrade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> terra grade. <laughs> terra grade, tardigrade, whatever. <laughs> so, but it, you know, the microbes are the original terraforms. They, they transform soil through a complex grouping of biological, chemical, and physical transformations, taking us from the per pejorative term dirt to the wondrous material that we all should call soil. And that was my disclaimer to lessen the hate mail from the ecologist. And uh, the first the thesis statement of this review truly sets the tone of what we as microbiologists need to be appreciating. And since this is TWIM, after all, we can do it in pursuit of the microbial wonder to actually help the ecologists and the soil hydrologists to fix this precious resource. For when soil life disappears or degrades for whatever reason, generally the term that is bandied about is environmental disturbances. And then eco services or ecosystem services are also effective. Now, this was true in the 1980s as it is today, especially given the senseless destruction that we are witnessing in the Ukraine, where they're literally tearing up all that beautiful farmland that was, you know, Ukraine. The globe, though, has been continuously dealing with disruptions from whether it be climate and its associated perturbations to differences in redox gases in the atmosphere. Today, it's CO2 that's leading to global climate change. 3.2 billion years ago, it was an ever-increasing concentration of a corrosive gas where it ultimately accumulated to approximately 21% of our atmosphere. And that gas, of course, is the great electron acceptor we all know and love as oxygen which led to an expansion of our human population with all of the externalities that we as humans have done to modify soil and, of course, accelerated degradation. Remember, for each and every one of these perturbations can affect soil. Now, the authors in their introductory remarks offer some scary statistics. First, one-third of all the global land surfaces are degraded to some extent. I had no idea things were getting so bad. Second, we are losing 24 billion metric tons or 24 billion kilograms, which if you're keeping score, 
That is a loss in soil to the equivalent of 300 million people. Just imagine that. A population almost the size of the United States is disappearing each year. And that's the fertile soil that we're losing. And it's also estimated that that loss of soil is resulting in the displacement of about 50 million real people. Where's the soil going, Michael, in the oceans? It's going into the oceans. Does it do any good there? Uh, We don't know. The ocean (laughs) is truly the unseen life of the planet, if, if we really think about it. It's likely to go into the sediments, right? Yeah, yeah it, it's going coastal, in coastal sediments, right? Yeah, coastal sediments. It's yeah. what's responsible for the clogging of the Mississippi River Delta and the flooding of New Orleans. Another fact that you need for future figuring is that soil water only represents 0.05% of the global freshwater stocks. Yet we know it is essential for the support of terrestrial life. So I ask you again, what's a microbiologist to do? How can we help move this field of microbial soil restoration forward? And as you might imagine, these authors offer a number of factors that need to be considered and offer us the -the state-of-the-art call to action in the review article. It's nicely packaged up for us. Unfortunately, it's behind the paywall And it's in box one, but they entitle it methodological challenges. And as a number of studies that they go through in this really terrific review, they have explored the role of biofilms in soil physical processes. And they offer that most of these studies face methodological issues. And I'm here to sort of challenge us all who work on the microbiome to think about the challenges they lay out for studying the soil microbiome and soils because the same methodological issues also are present when we look at people. So the first thing they tell everyone to do, and this is something that I'm sure Dr. Martin has told drilled into the heads of his young micronauts, is to set your proper controls. I mean, the authors offered here that when investigating the effects of microorganisms on soil hydraulic properties, and that's one of the critical elements they they weave through their narrative, the control group often fails to include all the constituents of the media that had been used along with the microbes in the treatment group. They pointed out that soil additives can affect soil hydrology, how water moves, and a lack of the proper negative controls then prohibits distinguishing effects of the tested microbes from the effects of the media. So, you know, that just makes perfect sense. And, you know, any good um, introductory course really reviews the importance of controls. And if you listen to the any of the podcast that Vincent's co-host, you know, they're forever talking about controls. Next up, combining microbiological and hydrological methodologies. Here, they point out that the enemy is time because for measurements of soils, hydrophysical properties, this may take weeks. The laboratory needs to be temperature and humidity controlled, Low temperature is important for minimizing microbial growth that could alter hydraulic parameters. And while these measurements take place, uh, you know, you have to be able to control for that. The third thing is standardizing the hydrological methodology. Now, this is a statement of fact that my dear immunological colleagues must pay attention to. I don't think the immunologists have standardized at anything ever. And here again, their call to action is standardizing on the proper hydrological methodology so you can actually understand what the microbes in the water are doing. Next up is how to monitor microbial growth. We know that there's a lot of things that we can't grow. 
So what do we use? And again, this drives home the fact of setting your experimental plate before you. Know what you're going to measure and then measure it. And there are two others. The microorganisms addition to a sterilized and not living soil. So again, you have a properly control and they go into great detail, introducing us to the concept of if you will, a notobiotic plant. This is a plant born without microbes. And of course, we have notobiotic animals. We've talked about them on TWIM. And then finally, finding the suitable microbes. So those six points are really everything that you need to know when you're really setting up any microbial experiment. You, you really need to think about these things six things. So the box is really Mark's course in microbiology that he's given to his students. I mean, you're, you've been telling your students this, haven't you, Mark? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Have they been listening? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I start with them actually looking at what lives in their water bottles. Uh huh. And we found antibiotic producers in there. <laughs> this, this is, this is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So even if soil is not your jam, think about the, the methodological challenges whenever you're setting up a question. So again, begging the question, what is a microbiologist to do? So they start by highlighting the groups of microbes that have the potential in their abilities to offer land restoration as well as being able to affect soil properties. Now, this is likely old hat to some of our listeners, the farmers who may be listening as they're doing their spring planting. We get letters from people driving combines telling us they listen to TWIM. So this is an homage to them as they're putting in this year's crop. And they offer an interesting exposition on how hydrological restoration from local to landscape scale with an understanding of the soil microbes and their interactions with the plants can help improve and sustain the movement of water, the soil hydrological functioning, leading to a more resilient and healthy e ecosystem. So the first microbes up are, they abbreviate these as PGPRs. And these are the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. And these are truly the wonder cons of the microbial world. Rhizobacteria are really quite terrific because what do they do? They fix nitrogen and they do all sorts of other interactions with the plant, stealing nutrients from the plant, giving nutrients to the plant, and they interact. And then there's another term that they introduced that I wasn't familiar with. And these are the Muscular mycorrhizal fungi, which recall that our buscules are the site of nutrient exchange between the plant and the fungus. And of course, then there's the ecto mycorrhizal fungi, which is in between the root and the fungus. And finally, the, the important other species, or uh, I guess it would be a family of microbes or the blue-green algae that can also fix nitrogen through a remarkable structure called the heterocysts. And they serve to do this soil, biological soil crust microbes. They fall into the BSC category. And then they go into describing how these plant microbe interactions take place. And they take us down the garden path of pointing out to us that it's a community. We have a range of microbes from the archaea to the bacteria, to the fungi, to the viruses, and even the protists. And so much of our understanding of this has been made by uh, making sense out of the large volume of next generation sequencing data that has been generated. And, you know, this was advanced by people like Pat Schloss, Michelle's colleague at Michigan, and of course, our former co-host, Joe Handelsman. And their papers can actually serve those of you interested in 
getting into this field as guides or entry points to see what's been going on here. But the offers offer experimental systems out there. And again, this is where they introduce us to the notobiotic plants, enabling us to do those sorts of experiments to actually figure out what's actually going on, who's contributing, and what good they're doing. They offer novel methods for this exometabolomics that can aid us in unraveling or making sense of the mechanisms. And anyone who's ever written a grant knows you have to have a piece in there about mechanism in order to get it funded. And so the underlying mechanisms of how the plants and the microbes are actively shaping each other really will provide us that molecular insight into these microbial-induced spe- uh, specialized metabolism between in the plant as well as in the microbes. And then, of course, they're the root nodules. Anyone who's ever you know, harvested peanuts knows about the root nodules. And it, it really is a quite remarkable narrative. It goes into greater detail in the paper, but then they bring up the, the elephant in the room, how to restore dry land. And this section was really offering much of what we're facing in many areas of the world where drought is now a reality. And in fact, we, we now know that in the southwestern United States, we've not seen this level of low water in over 1,200 years. And so, candidly, I hadn't been reading in this area, and this was another rationale for me picking up this paper as it was out of my comfort zone. So here I learned that there are several species of algae that promote soil hydrological properties by breaking the water repellency. So the water just doesn't, you know, sit there and evaporate and run away. It serves to improve water availability. It did not surprise me that the fungi showed higher resistance to desiccation than the bacteria. I mean, it's no surprise to any of us who teach MedMicro because we talk about the evils of Canada in its hyphal form and how the hyphal form facilitates invasion. Well, that's exactly what the fungus fungus is doing. It's making these hyphae that are effectively weaving their way into the soil, breaking it up, sort of aerating it for you that will facilitate the recovery of the soil. Now, Another fascinating aspect that I was unaware of is the microbes affiliated with dry land restoration. There was an increase in abundances of cyanobacteria. And then a term I never really heard use, monoderm bacteria, which are prokaryotes surrounded by a single membrane. Well, every microbiologist knows what they're called. Those are called gram positives. The gram negatives are the ones with the double membrane that we call LPS, you know, the outer membrane. You know, it's it's sitting out there by itself. But the monoderms are the gram positives. And they point out with some exceptions. With some exceptions. There's this is microbiology. There are always exceptions, Elio. But the big ones are actinobacteria which include the actinomyces, which is very important for antibiotics, the chloroflexi, which are filamentous bacteria that predominate our activated sludge wastewater treatment plants all over the globe. And then, of course, there's the firmicutes, which are also gram positives. And pop quiz of the day, why are firmicutes important to human health? It's because of their waste product, butyrate. It feeds our colonic enterocytes. And if you don't have the right balance of firmicutes in your gut, making the right amount of butyrate to feed your colon, the the downside is, you know, aberrant growth and cancer. And then you're going to be visiting a man with a hose who's going to go look around taking out polyps. 
Can we take a second and discuss sure. whether the terms monoderm and diderm should be widely used? I, I kind of like them. Uh-huh. I wonder if, do you? Anybody? I did. Uh, once I got into it, I think it would actually help our students because they don't know why we obsess over gram positives and gram negatives. And understanding the function of that second membrane really explains a lot of the pathology that's seen in the human condition. And more importantly, it explains a lot of the behaviors that these microorganisms are able to do. So I think it would be a, a good thing. And as you're you and Michelle are revising the book, it may be something to introduce. What do you think, Mark? I'd like to hear what Mark has to say. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, this is an issue that I'm always dealing with students. Remember, I just have one microbiology course, and I'm slipping this into my with this business I'm doing with my first-year students because there's a method to my madness. Uh, I always talk about this issue about the structure. The problem with gram-positive and gram-negative is, is you – you can't really say it's diagnostically separate in terms of phylogeny or anything that gets complicated. But I do think morphologically, it's a good thing to talk about. And specifically, students like it when you can talk about how antibiotics cross a membrane and some of the work the chemical, uh, the chemical biologists did in modifying um, antibiotics to cross that second membrane and what I was taught to call gram negatives. I have no trouble calling them monoderms and, and, and biderms. I think that's funny because then they're going to come up with a kind of derms on top of it, right? <laughs> but I like the idea very much because it's something that fits into the brain with an image almost. And I think that's important. Yeah, but, I like I like that. that. So gram negative, gram positive was we got from laboratory histology histology yeah. and i'm it doesn't tell you anything right but the mono and die really you think immediately about one and two membranes and i think that helps a lot so i like that yeah yeah and you know leave it to the folks in the netherlands to How set about the other two guys well, it, whether it, it catches on though is another thing because yeah clinical yeah, microbiologists that, will never do it right yeah they rule they rule <laughs> haters gotta hate vincent always yeah, it's, got good. A, it's good. Mark, there's a the, the term was coined by an Indian guy. What's his name? You probably know him. Monoderm? Know? Monoderms and, and biderms? Yeah. I don't know. I need to go look that up and talk about that in class. That's a lovely suggestion, Elio. But it was done by somebody from India. Okay. We're working in, in North America. I, I forgot his name. I'm sorry. Is. I forgot. I'll look it up. I will. I think that's a great thing because I really like talking about the personal aspects to science with students. Was it Gupta? Was it R.S. Gupta? Yes. That's him. Beautiful. Thank goodness for Google. What did we do? I, I don't know. Our brains were much more efficient. Hmm. And um, as is the tradition of digressing on on TWIV, we we could digress into d- discussing how SARS has put holes in our brains, but I think that happened well before uh, SARS. But back to our story, they also take us down the path of remediation of saline soils, and this is something that's directly affecting me here in Charleston because the sea is rising, and. You know, I literally watched a tree in my backyard die from saltwater incursion. So any student of history also knows what the Roman general uh, Scipio Aemilianus did. He plowed over and sowed the city of Carthage with salt after defeating it in the Third Punic War, or so the story goes. Well, today they offer that we have an opportunity to apply salt tolerant microbes and they can do the trick. So that's really something to think about, especially when you're using these plant growth promoting rhizobia, because some of them are actually uh, able to withstand the higher concentrations of salt. And so then you have this crosstalk between the plant to the gene expression responsible for the amelioration of salinity stress. 
And this is really opens up a whole new mechanism of study because if we could figure out the genes to turn on and turn off to deal with the higher salt load, then of course we can again begin to feed the planet. Because again, we keep making more people and we're going to need to generate more food. And the connection between plant stress responses, signaling molecules in the microbiome, well, again, we've discussed many of those similar papers looking at the microbiome and how it stresses our cells and the communication back and forth. But here, this understanding has the potential for, again, the human race to figure out an added ability to feed ourselves, similar to the consequences of the father of the Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug, and his contributions. I mean, he single-handedly was credited with saving over a billion people simply by breeding a, a first. He bred a strain of wheat that was resistant to rust, which is a fungus, And then he bred a strain of wheat that had a thicker stalk, so it wouldn't collapse. And of course, Borlaug won the Nobel Prize for that and for feeding the world and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But to the students who are listening, this is the future, folks, because for better or worse, we're going to have to feed ourselves before we can develop cancer. And... Well, again, a lot of the money is going to cancer. Very few of the research dollars are going to figuring out how to make soils better. And this is my shameless plug for investigator-initiated research. And the cancer people have the louder voices, Michael. They do indeed. They do indeed. But at the end of the day, they all need to eat. And they all want to eat well. Indeed. But – You know, the review goes on and it really walks us through many of the challenges and it's all summed up in figure four, which really demonstrates um, how the microorganisms are contributing. And when they compare and contrast the structure of a healthy and degraded soil mix, the image on the left is the healthy and it illustrates the hydrological fluxes in a healthy soil. And they point out the importance of the biofilm, the extrapolymeric substances that are these polymers that microbes make, and how it helps to uh, wet the soil and move the water and facilitate the breathing of the soil. And on the other side, they had the bad soil or the degraded land. And what they point out is something that we all appreciate from our discussions of dysbiosis in human health, namely the microbes in a dysbiotic individual, namely someone who's gone on antibiotics, their microbial diversity has declined. But in the healthy microbiome of the good soil, their microbiome is rich it's complex it's dynamic but in the degraded land it it's so so it it's like that larry david commercial ah you know it's it's not so good so you get the idea the significance of the understanding of all of this will help us not only feed more folks but may aid us in designing better experiments for us to understand the microbiome of people, animals, the whole bit. So I was really impressed with this review and um, they make a plea at the end for a team science approach and they desperately want the soil microbiologist and the soil hydrologist to get together and make a plan. And they point out that there's been very little collaboration and cooperation to date. And we really need to, to really drive home team science in something as simple, and I'm going to use the pejorative term, dirt. Very good, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I just wanted to add something really quick. I mean, the first part is I, I with, with all, I mean, I really appreciated the, the kind words, uh, you know, from Michael. But the cure that I'm doing with my students, the course-based authentic research experience 
where we're searching for antibiotics. That's the the tiny Earth people who are at the Wisconsin Institute for Institute for Discovery, run by Joe Handelsman, Nicole Broderick, now at Johns Hopkins. And I'm I'm teamed with them. And there's a network all over the world kind of crowdsourcing this search. I just want to make sure that that's very, very clear. Can we put that into the show notes, Mark? They, they are there. Well, yes. Yes, I can certainly do that. And I already put other things in the show notes that I think people should be interested in. The first is Joe Handelsman, friend of the show and, and a wonderful colleague, has written a book called A World Without Soil. And I put that in the show notes already. And I additionally put a link to a video that she's done about this issue. And she's quite passionate on the subject. And, and I know Michael Happy, she doesn't like the word dirt either. Yes. Well, she'll send me hate mail, but I, I hopefully no. covered my bets. No, is and, and you'll notice the hashtag she likes to use on social media is hashtag soil rocks. Yes. But I absolutely can add stuff about, about uh, Tiny Earth because it's it's really important. And the students, and these are first semester students, they're really enjoying it. So there you go. You know, one of her images is of the rich soil of the Ukraine. And this was made back in October. Yeah. Once upon a time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's senseless what we're doing to that rich country. Uh, what's, what's act, it's senseless what the Russians are doing to that rich country. I mean, it's just so sad. It and is. now Mark will tell us about something really big, really big. <laughs> I make a big deal out of small things, right? That's that's what I like to do. So I have to preface all of this with the fact that I live in Tacoma, Washington, on Puget Sound. And there's a long history of paper making and wood processing here in town. And there's a joke about it, the aroma of Tacoma. And what they're talking about is hydrogen sulfide. And this is integral to the topic that we're going to deal with today. You see, for about 100 years, there was a huge amount of lumber work here in Tacoma. They would take the sawdust left over and they would bury it right underground at the shoreline. Under the, and, and there are places where you can find a meter of sawdust under the sand. So it's all spongy. Tide comes in and that Buried wood waste becomes a giant bacterial fermenter full of sulfur-reducing organisms. And they generate huge amounts of hydrogen sulfide. The tide goes out. And what you get, and I am not making this number up, you can get as high as 5 millimolar hydrogen sulfide in the effluent running back into the ocean. This is about 50 times higher than you find at hydrothermal vents. And what you'll notice over and over again, and I sent you three some pictures, you see these large filaments all over everything there. So the point is, I've been interested in thiotrophic symbioses and thiotrophic associations for some time. And one of the things I want to tell everyone is these interesting organisms that use hydrogen sulfide as a source of high energy electrons, when they pull the electron off, they make sulfur. So most of these organisms either excrete sulfur granules or concentrate them in their cytoplasm, which are easily seen under a microscope. In addition, these filaments are enormous, or so I thought. On the subject of giant bacteria, Elio Schechter got me thinking about this many years ago. And the issue that we're dealing with is the relationship between volume and surface area so that surface area does not increase at the rate that volume does. And so many of these giant bacteria, and we'll touch on this in a moment as well, have large numbers of copies of their, of their DNA. I'm going to call them nucleoids, although pretty soon we will be able to call them nuclei, I'm pretty sure. But what the point is, why do they have so many copies? And it was Elio Schechter who introduced to me the idea of service to the cytoplasm. <laughs> when you have a large volume, a large cytoplasmic volume, there's a limit. And I have a biophysics senior taking my introductory biology course, and she scribbles furiously. Kelsey, I'm talking about you, uh, trying to figure out the rates at which these things happen, which is really interesting. 
So the whole thing is, is I've spent time in my microbiology class talking about thiomargarita, about Ipula pisium, and Acroma, Acromabacter. And in the show notes, I put some interesting background information, a couple of short videos, and some small things considered essays written by Aleo and other, com- other people about this. So this idea is an interesting one. How big can you get a cell to be? Why are we composed of many tiny cells instead of one large cell? I want to put acetabularia, uh, a eukaryotic algae, to one side. That's an unusual case. But the fact of the matter is that surface, um, that surface area and volume issue comes back over and over again. So imagine how I feel when I read a paper that has the title, and by the way, Elio, I was, con- I was uh, singing your praises for ideas that you gave me. So imagine, imagine how I feel when I see this paper, a centimeter long bacterium with DNA compartmentalized into membrane bound mm-hmm. organelles. There's an expression that I use, OMG, for overwhelming microbial greatness. You can imagine my head exploding. We have 20 authors on this particular publication. Um, I would honestly say that the corresponding authors are going to be, um, looks like Jean-Marie Valland, Tanya Woke, and Shalish Day. And what I like about this is the huge number of different people ranging from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to folks in Paris, folks in in Guadalupe, uh, all over the world coming together to make this happen, including the wonderful Esther Angert, who has a lot of experience with giant microbes. So this is a fantastic paper. And what I would tell you about it is that the publication itself is six pages long. Uh, But I want to tell you about it, that it has a huge amount of supplementary material. And normally, students will kind of roll their eyes about that. But I have to tell you, it's wonderful to see the way that they just pick up a hammer and they hammer with different machinery, different techniques to prove their points. It is just wonderful. Fluorescence microscopy, x-ray microscopy, a elemental analysis, electron microscopy, and I'm waiting for electron cryotomography. So my friend, again, coming back to the Netherlands, Ariane Brian will will be talking about this, I'm sure, at some point. But what they're talking about is this organism that they call Candidatus thiomargarita magnifica. What a great name. And this enormous organism has a number of strategies to avoid this surface uh, area volume problem. Now, the first thing, and this is in common with other species of thiomargarita, is that they, and I I redescribe it to my students as cheat a little, they have a large internal vacuole. And incidentally, nitrate is kept in that in the type organisms as an electron acceptor in place of oxygen. So I think of it like a nitrate scuba tank. So that's one thing that they do, is they have this enormous vacuole. Mark, where do they get this? Big guy. Lesser Antilles. Oh, not in University of Puget Sound? Oh, I'm so angry. You could look but in your... It, but it, could you get it there? Could you send a batch of students out? I Well, we've looked at these filaments. Most of what I see, and they describe in the paper, and they give examples of organisms like Marathrix, which is what Joel Elliott in my department and I have, have, have seen for a lot of these. And they often have cross walls. I'm going to come back to that. So I won't use the term trichome, but I will say that it looks like rather than one enormous, you know, I used to call these things centitia, but I don't think that's a correct use of the term, but a bunch of different nucleoids with one cytoplasm that you see here. On the other hand, there's a lot of diversity of what we see, and I sent you folks pictures of these. So it could be that things like this are there because they're certainly taking advantage of the high sulfide situation. So they're in Lesser Antilles, uh, and they found this on um, basically mangrove swamps attached to sunken leaves of alga. And you can imagine how stinky that is, and and I'm, I'm quite familiar with that. And this isn't a situation, again, where you see many cross walls, as you see, again, here in Puget Sound. But the interesting part about it to me 
is that central vacuole, and they, they do a wonderful job explaining how they measure this. Uh, 70 73% of the cellular vol volume is vacuolar. So the cytoplasm is pushed up against the side. And again, because these live in microaerophilic or even anaerobic environments, it's a good place to dump your electrons. But as I told you at the begin beginning, as you do that, um, there are organisms like Archobacter that secrete sulfur outside the cells. But this organism, like a lot that I see, they make little crystals of sulfur in the cytoplasm. And students will say, doesn't that limit how quickly they grow? I said, yes. Yes, indeed, it does. <laughs> but they're wonderful to look at because that's something that you can see. What I like about the filaments that I see is that I don't have to worry about like using uh, objective oil. I can use about 40X and see everything I, I need to see. Remember, these folks are basically picking up these leaves and taking a pair of tweezers. And they're, they're pulling off these filaments to look at. What is very interesting beside the sulfur granules, again, in the border of the cytoplasm, are what are absolutely very clearly membrane-bound compartments. And they call them pepins, which I thought was just P-E-P-I-N-S, which I thought was so much fun to hear about. Except it's probably in French, and I'm, I'm mispronouncing it, Elio. Pepin. Well, that's, that's good. You sound, you sound like a character. That's great. But it depends, right? I, I don't know. But they're these small, um, in, they're small intras, intracellular membrane-bound compartments. And inside those, you see, get ready for it, DNA and friends, ribosomes. Lots and lots of ribosomes. Now, well, that shouldn't be surprising because transcription and translation are coupled. Well, see, this is an issue whenever you start to have the argument of whether there's a proto-nucleus, Michael, because you want to be able to show, like in us, the messenger RNA transports out to the cytoplasm where it's translated, and we would expect in these kinds of things to see something similar. And a, a couple of examples that I've seen, uh, there are some sewage um, sewage plant organisms of, among the planktomycetes that seem to have membrane-bound compartments that appear to have uh, DNA in them. But no one's able to do the famous experiment that the pulse chase to show that the messenger RNA moves out, right? But um, it's absolutely true that they have ribosomes in there. Now, what I want to point out, and this number is real, 37,000 genome copies per millimeter of filament, gulp, and this takes us back to what I had told you at the beginning about Alio's comment to me many years ago about service to the cytoplasm. So if you have a huge cytoplasmic volume and here's your nucleoid over there, everything has to diffuse to where it's needed. But when you have many copies of that, it's a little bit different. So because they were influenced by achromobacter, they actually did some studies to show that they're not seeing lots of differences, i.e., you don't see variation in complement among the pepins, which is, is good to know. And they did that through average nucleotide identity of a number of genes. Check out the genome size, friends. 12 megabytes, or 12 megabases, excuse me, megabytes. <laughs> Anyway, 12 megabases, this rivals yeast and aspergillus, right? There are almost 12,000 genes identified by looking at starts and stops, but half of those have no official function. There was a lot, they've done a lot of work with what I, I like to call structural genomics, where they try and look at the annotation and make predictions it looks like there's fully functional glycolysis, and that kind of makes sense. I, I agree with that. Fully functional TCA, well, there'd better be. Um, but And of course, lots and lots of stuff having to do with Rubisco and other aspects of chemoautotrophy and sulfide oxidation. It is very clear, based on nitrogen metabolism, that they're using what I presume is nitrate in their vacuole as a terminal electron acceptor. Uh, but the part that got me, friends, is I spent a lot of time looking at those filaments down there in the stinky parts of Reconciliation Bay here. And when you look at those, those filaments, they're covered with other microbes. 
These aren't. That's the first thing I noticed. Why aren't they covered with other micros? Because any surface gets colonized except these. Number one, look at the genome. There are clearly evidence of clusters of secondary metabolite-like genes, presumably making antimicrobial compounds. If that's not a kick in the microbial pants enough for you, there's also evidence of a couple of, of type 4 and type 6 secretory systems that might be keeping these um, colonists settling on them. Now we come back to the really interesting stuff uh, with having this long filament. Because, you know, if you look at the bacterial cytoskeleton, you, if you're missing MREB, for example, that protein, um, you, you uh, can't make a rod anymore, that kind of thing. FTSZ controls the long filamentation, that kind of thing. So FTSA, which is one of the things that helps with cross walls, appears to be missing. FTSZ, again, with elongation is present. So that fits in with a relative lack of cross walls in the filament. And they used a term which will make Jonathan Eisen, I think, roll his eyes. Because like me, people use ohm too much in biology. So they use the term elongosome. And I love that term elongosome. And what they mean by that are the genes associated with elongation of cells. E-L-O-N-G-A. S-O-M-E. Okay. So all that they're trying to make the claim here is when you're looking at this kind of business, what you're seeing is a situation where the genes involved with an elongation of the filament, filament are present. The genes involved with the cross walls are absent or, in very, or, or not terribly active is what it looks like. And that takes us to something else that's very, very strange. If you look at the way E. pulopisium divides, that's another large organism found in the guts of surgeon fish, they do something that looks like live birth. And if you look at pictures of it, it's very wonderful. But what it really is, is a variation on making a spore. And natural selection kind of Darwinoed or Dar Darwinian sculpture took place of those particular genes so that that was the approach that's used from those central mechanisms. So when I look at the, what they're calling budding at the tips of these filaments, I start to think this is an uber colobacter. Remember mm. the sessile form and uh -huh. the little swimmers? I'm not claiming there are swimmers here. But the thought is in this paper, the authors advance is that what you're looking at is a situation where you have a dimorphic life cycle and the small buds are their dispersal form. Interestingly, smaller number of pepins in those buds. So it may be that they're on the road to creating a separate partition for parts of their genome. And that's to me, is a fantastic thing to think about. So to wrap up, so I can hear what you think, um, they make the comment, once again, do we need to rethink how, with the terminology used with bacteria and archaea? Um, do we need to redefine the term prokaryote, right? Is this the issue that we have by thinking every organism is like E. coli, what I call coli centricity? And I really think that nature will teach us things by going out and looking in unusual environments. And I think that is that um, gives us the perspective that we sometimes miss when we look through a microscope. So I was very impressed with this. I urge everyone to look at the supplementary material. I cannot wait for it to come out. It was really remarkable. I have more to talk about in the fall, don't I? You do indeed. How many membranes? One or two? <laughs> looks like two, and then it looks like the pepins have them too. Double so it's membrane. four? It's four? Well, you know, um, looks like it. They're, they, they're, they look like typical proteobacteria in terms of their 16S, of which they yeah. have a gazillion copies, right? Well, isn't this a nice illustration of the simple fact that biology, especially microbiology, has certain rules 
and many exceptions to any rule you can come up with. That's right. It doesn't mean that the rule is wrong. It means it has exceptions. Yes. And that's what we got. We got to live with it. You, you know, I, I, uh, some are, some are a real surprise. Yes. This one is a medium surprise, I would say. I agree. You know, it, I'm not, I, I was, I, I, I didn't fall off my chair when I read this paper. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm ready. See, by now I'm ready to say anything I can think of, uh, as a truism in microbiology has exceptions. Well, you know, Alio, to be honest with you, as a physics professor once said as a joke to me, constants aren't and variables don't. <laughs> Trying to teach me not to trust rules. And I would argue that authority remains the enemy of science because, you know, uh, to borrow from, I guess it was Will Rogers, it's not what you think is true. It's the problem. It's what's not true that you think is true where we get into trouble. And I agree with that. They were here first and they'll be here last. You've heard me say it, Elio. First evolved, last extinct. And they, I, I, I hate to say the word clever because I'm anthropomorphizing or are they doing that to me? I couldn't tell you. But it's absolutely true that they're protean in form and function and wonderful beyond words. And this is another example of what you what you see when you look in a strange place. And Elio, I think if you dig deeply in the paper, I think you're going to see that there was some work done by that that Mary Yule referred to that's relevant to this many, many years ago. Rest in peace. So um they say the pips are the pepin is is named after pips, the small seeds and fruits, right? Right and there and vulgar Latin pep an expression of creation used to express smallness. So these pepins have DNA and they got ribosomes next to them. So it's a way to solve the problem of having the DNA and, and the transcription and the translation machinery throughout this huge cell, right? Yeah, yeah, That's the idea. And, and I want to know how the proteins get out. Yeah, out of the pepin. Yes. Because it's it, probably a secretion machine. I'll bet you if you look for sec A, it's there. And, and, but, but in interior sec A, Michael, that's the cool thing, right? Well, you know, the facultative intracellular parasites yeah. like listeria, mycobacteria, they have all two, two copies of sec A. And the second copy of sec A in those facultative intracellular parasites can be deleted, disrupted, and destroyed uh, because then the primary – uh, sec A protein, which you can't delete, disrupt, or destroy in bacteria, will get it done. And so I'll bet you it's a, a facsimile to the, the, if you will, the parents' sec A. Because they're, they're, the pepins aren't daughters. They're, it, it's not like a, a spore, per se, because right. they're, it, it's, it's sort of like, they're doing the just in time factory. They're building the little tiny factory at the site that they need the products. And it, they're see, dealing it, with supply chain. They're dealing with supply chain. They're making pipette tips and getting them to me too slowly. Yes. So do these each pepin has the whole genome complement? Wow. And how just, these you never know what you're going to need, Vincent. How do these things reproduce? The, the little little guys bud off the ends? Is that it? It looks like budding. Huh. And if you haven't read about achromobacter or achromation, I'm probably saying that incorrectly. But there's a wonderful article I put in the show notes on this uh, from Small Things Considered that actually talks about the fact that some of those different genomes within the same cytoplasm are different from one another. Like it's mm -hmm. a community organism, which would make the spirit of Carl Woes very happy. <laughs> but, um, you, you know, what I'm trying to say is they looked for that and did not see that. Mm -hmm. So I, t I tend to think of it as an uber colobacter. <laughs> can, can they grow these in culture, Mark? No, they cannot. They take them back. And I love their description of putting the leaves in like a column, just like my colleague Joel Elliott does. And it's just, it's hysterical to think about these like goofy, smelly looking things with scum and you're like treating them very gently because you traveled all over the world to get them, right? Mm. We do the same thing. Some of the ones that are like this too, they'll move up and down uh, the sediment 
to follow um, hydrogen sulfide and oxygen, uh, which is really interesting. So, uh, Mark, there have to be viruses that infect this thing, right? I think. So. Can you name an organism that doesn't? No. Uh, well, we haven't found it. There, there is apparently um, tetrahymena. Nobody has found a virus of tetrahymena. But I, it has four hymens. <laughs> they just yeah. haven't found it. I'm sure that they exist. Yes, Mark. And is there so, is there elements of RNA viruses in the genome like we have though? You mean uh, endogenous uh, viruses? Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. There may not be, and that may be part of the reason uh, why we haven't found them. Because but in this so case, Mark, the, you, you have to be able to grow them to show that a, a virus can infect them, unfortunately, right? Right. Unless they can just survive long enough. Yeah. What is fascinating to me is that they are clean on the outside. And that's weird. That's very weird. I'm not used to that at all. To the point where when I've wanted to talk to people about looking at some of the filaments that I see that we're pretty sure are merithrix, it, 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 you, you know, you're not able to get them without other things that are on their surface. Right. And it, it kind of makes sense. They're going to be secreting things that are, are, are yummy, for lack of a better term. Although it may not be as big of an issue living in a very, very nutrient rich environment. So what you're saying is that they can't form, they can't participate in a biofilm community. Well, they're so big, they kind of just by themselves are the biofilm. Don't you imagine? They'll form rosettes. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's really unusual because even, even the microbes that combat each other actually coexist in a biofilm. I mean, it's one of the... Again, here we go making rules. It's one of the tenets that microbes love to form biofilms. And they form these communities amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's after all we were talking about in the first paper with soil. I mean, right. it's a complex, dynamic, microbial plant interaction. And it's it's really unusual. I think it's probably because the environment that they are in is extreme. I want you to also remember, Michael, that Joe Handelsman and her, her wonderful folk have found flavobacteria that live within the peptidoglycan layer in Bacillus, subtle, in Bacillus cereus in the soil. So I call them peptidoglycan surfers. I don't think that's a real popular terminology over in Wisconsin. So um, <laughs> hitchhikers are fine to say. But I tend to think of any surface as something that can get colonized, is my point. And that's what you yeah. get in the soil. And, and remember, the peptidoglycan layer of Bacillus cereus, especially the Mycotes variant, is really quite elaborate. Yes. And, you know, the surface area to mass ratio, especially in the Mycotes variant, really looks almost mycelial like. Yes. Yes, it does. And and so you can imagine why microbes would attach onto it because it's a good surface to effectively lay root into mm -hmm. and they can hold on to it because after all, that's the life of a microbe. Hold on to an area where there's nutrients being delivered for you. I, I will say this is that Thio Margarita is living in a place which is fairly static in a mangrove sw swamp. So there's not a lot of flow. So a lot of times biofilms happen to take advantage of nutrients that kind of flow by. And I, I can appreciate that, whether it's our gut or inside a, uh, a water bottle or inside a, 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 big, a big pipe. That makes sense to me. Or as Norm Pace would say, in your shower head, because that's true. So, but with that in mind, these things are autotrophic. They have rubisco. I presume they have some, it looks like they have some transport activity. I bet they're mostly autotrophic because of the high levels of hydrogen sulfide. They may not need to have a big consortium of other organisms around. Their limitation is probably CO2. I would think so. Their, their limitation is probably delivery of CO2 and the, the absolute uh, tension of CO2 in the medium. I'd be very interested to see the activity of carbonic anhydrase there. Yeah. That would be interesting to me. 
Mark, you didn't mention that in in their figure one, they use for scale a tardigrade. I, I was waiting for you to mention it. And they, they put in nematodes, let's be fair, right? Yeah. But we didn't want him we didn't want to send him on his path. I yeah. mean, he's already had one on his shoulder. That's right. Well, I've got lots of them around here, so you don't have to worry about that. But you know, the important thing here is that I'm used to seeing, for example, Phio Margarita um Nabiensis, where they'll show that next to a fruit fly head. I'm used to that. This is bigger. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Sure is. Well, the picture that they have in science yes. is a dime, for goodness yeah. sake. And again, yeah. I can find filaments that size too, but they're not one cytoplasm. Yeah. At least yeah. so far. Very and they cool. are beautiful. They smell bad, but they are beautiful. Great story. Hope it gets published in a prominent place. It would really be nice. Well, I mean, the authors are are really, as I call them, VIMs for very important microbiologists. So I imagine <laughs> it'll happen. Hopefully. We'll see. Uh, just um, parenthetically, on TWIV last week, we talked about a giant virus. The first giant virus discovered Mimi virus, right? And a group, the group that discovered it have now solved the structure of how the DNA is compacted inside of it because it's a 1.2 million base pair DNA. So it has to be compacted in a certain way. And it's elegant. Six strands of double-stranded DNA go back and forth within this helical structure made up of the same protein that makes up the filaments that are on the outside of the Mimi virus. And interspersed among the strands of DNA are molecules of RNA polymerase. Ah, getting ready to go. Getting ready to grow. And so I love it that geez, all things giant are being studied still. I mean, it's important, right? So I want to put you on the spot, Vincent. Are you ready? Yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. So when people ask me, how did viruses evolve? Were they mobile DNA elements that learned how to exist outside a cell, or are they cells that lost a whole bunch of functions? I often say yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're so cheating. Yes, it's probably a mix of both, but remember the RNA world was first. Yes. And in the RNA world, there were RNA self-replicating RNA molecules that existed in the absence of cell, the pre-cellular world. And then Proteins came about at some point and then reverse transcriptase that could copy the RNA to DNA. And that probably gave rise to DNA based cells at some point where the, you need the DNA to be big to support a cell, right? RNA can't support cellular life. And so then probably those RNAs went into the cells and picked up capsids. And that was the first virus. Probably the first viruses were RNA viruses. And then there were DNA viruses, but some of them may have also left and become viruses, but the earliest were certainly RNAs that went into cells. Yeah. I agree. And you should probably call them, rather than capsids, you should probably call them, they just went in looking for basic proteins ha. to condense the nucleic acid around. Yeah. And that is what probably beget a capsid. Well, so the, uh, the um, first proteins that evolved were nucleic acid binding proteins. Yeah. It's one of the oldest motifs. I get yep. I get so frustrated because there uh, only one class I can do with this, and so I can't say to them, <laughs> look at bacteriophage mu. The darn thing's a transposable element, and it's carrying all the the capsid proteins yeah. and replic yeah. repli replicative machinery inside it. It's just wonderful. So that's why I say yes. It's it's all of the above. Yeah, I agree. I think that's fine to say both. Even uh, Eugene Coonan, who I think is the expert on this. Uh, agrees they're they're both feasible and you can't rule e e either one out so right we don't have that kind of uh evidence so i want we last time thank you mark that's fantastic last time i i called out to our read our listeners for some email and we got a bunch so i want to read a couple and mark is here and one of them is is addressed to mark but so the first one is from sean from bristol uk 
First time listener and emailer. Twiv was my gateway drug, and now I think I have a new high. Oh, God. First, a point about the micro nanoplastics. You mentioned these were created through abrasion. Those are the plastics in, in fruit, right, Michael? You did that. Yes. Paper. Yeah, we did the fruit paper. Yeah. I believe current opinion is that clo clothing washing is the predominant source of micro nanoplastics due to the predominantly plastic based nature of our textiles and the process of cleaning them, which involves rubbing them together in a detergent solution for a couple of hours before flushing the result down the drain. Okay, that, that sounds good to me. Secondly, the paper you read discussed the search for enzymes that could be co-opted for the breakdown of plastics in the environment. I was wondering what the resulting byproducts of this breakdown are likely to be. For example, sugars are broken down into alcohol, which is a toxin we quite like by yeast. But what is the danger of something less cordial to a great party being produced in bulk in our environment? Fantastic podcast. I look forward to exploring your back catalog. So, Michael, what are they going to be broken down to? Uh, remember, one man's poison is another man's food. <laughs> and the alcohols will de get degraded, you know, just by anything that has an alcohol dehydrogenase. So steal off the electrons and make lunch out of it. I, I, so, you're not, so you're not worried? I, I'm not worried. I mean, this goes on in our gut all the time. We make okay. these short chain fatty acids. Remember, the alcohol is really you're just dumping electrons yeah. into it to regenerate your oxidized, oxidized NAD that you need to burn any carbon. It's all about oxidized NAD. Right. If you If you have it. You can burn anything. If you have no oxidized NAD, you're stuck. I found an article that I'll put up in the, the show notes, and it's uh, Frontiers in Microbiology from 2020. And the title is Microbial Degradation, and I love this word, Valorization of Plastic Wastes. Hmm. And so I'll Very put good. that up there. There's Very some good. stuff there. All right. The next one's from Mike. I, I just listened to episode 259, Sea Sawdust. That was last time you were on, Mark. Several ideas mentioned triangulate around the problem of excessive nutrient runoff and the resulting dead zones in estuaries and the open oceans. Nutrient balance in marine environments is the problem. This is the result of human production of excess nutrients. You mentioned that most of the ocean is oligotrophic or nutrient poor and that some organisms expend a lot of effort to fix atmospheric nitrogen. Dead zones are the opposite of that problem. I'm interested in widespread mechanical filtration of freshwater reservoirs as a way to take up excess nutrients through the harvest of algae as a bioremediator. The immediate benefit would be the opening up of recreational reservoirs by limiting harmful algal blooms in those lakes. The long-term benefit would be to depress artificially high nutrient levels in those reservoirs and sequestering and reusing those nutrients as agricultural fertilizer rather than allowing them to contribute to the excess nutrients causing dead zones. The question is whether or not harvesting of algae would depress nutrients in the water. Dr. Martin mentioned that eco-engineering was dangerous, which is exactly what I am proposing. However, this project is the flip side of the coin of a large-scale bioengineering project already being executed in an uncontrolled fashion, namely the widespread release of excess nutrients into our waterways. I contend that we are responsive for reversing the effects we are already having on the planet. Your thoughts? Sure. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I was thinking to myself that, you know, making sure you have less runoff that you take care is, is a good thing to think about. What I, as a science fiction reader, was concerned about is possible feed forward of the iron dust experiment. Um, and of course, you just you get to a point where you can't prove a negative. So you have to be very cautious with this. Mm. But I would say that smaller bodies of water, of course, we need to clean them up. And and th that's really no different than how we clean up sewage. And a lot and everyone, when, when we say clean up sewage, they think about it as just getting, you know, waste material out of it. But what you're doing is removing too many nutrients. And that's really what sewage treatment is, which is a right. wonderful thing. Uh, I, I would I would simply say that if you look at some of the satellite photography that show a cyanobacterial or an algal bloom from space, and you'll often see where things that 
viruses that go after those things will actually, you can actually watch it happen over time. Mm. So again, it's, it's a large, complicated thing with many parts. I, I think that the, the, let's make sure I get the name right. I mean, Mike is right. I mean, we, we've made a mess of things and trying to fix it is an important imperative. I, I just would rather we don't do global bio, uh, global ecological yeah. engineering. Yeah. All right. One more from Tricia, who is an associate professor of biology at Allegheny College. So, Mark, this is for you. Two, two small, nice colleges, right? Tricia yeah. uh, normally teaches a general microbiology class that covers the field broadly with new curricular needs in my department. I'm thinking I ought to offer a course in microbial ecology, but I'm a pathogenesis person and a whole course on ecology is quite a stretch. I'm hoping you can help me with two things. First, do you have a textbook you would recommend for a single semester upper level course for undergraduate biology and maybe environmental science majors? And two, do you have any resources to recommend so I can give myself a crash course in the area? Okay, Mark. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I was once uh, at an institution, remain nameless, visiting, <laughs> and I gave a seminar. And the person uh, after my seminar is a very famous person whose names you know that we haven't mentioned today, let me say, uh, sat down and said to me, and I quote, you speak very clearly for an ecologist. <laughs> and I said, but I'm not an ecologist. I'm trained as a geneticist. And this person said, no, you're not. You're an ecologist. So we went back and forth on that for a while. Mm. But I've come to really appreciate microbial ecology, even though that's not my training. Now, when I used a textbook a little bit like this years ago, it was Atlas and Bartha, but that's almost 20 years old. I haven't really looked at the newer ones. But I would say I'm a big fan of 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 um, and we have one of the authors here and and another one who couldn't be here today of microbe i think microbe has some really interesting sections in it that relate to uh, microbial ecology and i want to do a shout out to the late great ed ledbetter because this subject came up all the time what textbook do you use and he would look at me and say there are three two for you and one for the student and I think that there's an element of truth to that. Great. I want to wrap it up because I know we're, we're running short on time. But what I really recommend someone who doesn't have a background do is start with Carl Zimmer's essay, The Human Lake. And that's a wonderful essay that starts with the history of ecology and then ties in uh, especially human-centric microbiology to that. Also, this particular book is awesome. I don't know if you can see that. It's Betsy Dyer's book, A Field Guide to the Bacteria. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, and of course, have your students make Wynagrovsky columns and mud watts, those, um, electric bio, those bacterial electrical generators. A fantastic thing for students to see how each individual vessel is its own ecosystem. Okay. Well, you should mention that uh, Michelle... Our collaborator is not here today. is wor working on another version of Microbe, and I bet you it's going to be a very, very good book. I look forward to it, Elio, because it's it's the one I've been using now for years. Go on. Glad to hear that. Thank you, Mark. And that'll do it for TWIM261. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM. You can send your questions, comments to TWIM at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We are a 501c3 nonprofit entity, so your contributions are tax deductible. Our guest today from the University of Puget Sound, Mark Martin. Always great to have you. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Elio Schechter's at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. And Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. I'm, I'm, by the way, Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. <laughs>